All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to chapter 11. Um, the focus of this chapter is, uh, well, the title is Measuring the Cost of Living. The focus of this chapter, though, is on measuring the price level, OK? Measuring the price level. Now, uh, here's kind of what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at what is the consumer price index and how is it calculated. So just a reminder, last chapter was chapter 10. And we measured what? The GDP, right, the gross domestic product, which, although it is in dollars, is actually a measure of stuff, of products that are produced, right? So last chapter, chapter 10, we measured the productivity or the number of products produced in a country because that's also equal to the amount of income that people makes, right? And so if we understand how productive people are, we can understand how much income people have, and we can understand how well off they are, right? Remember the circular flow diagram always tells us that however much goods and services are made ends up being how much income people get, OK? And so in that chapter, we talked about this thing called the GDP deflator, which was a measure of the price level. Even though it's got the same name, GDP, it had nothing to do with products. We were talking about how the prices changed, right? So now we're actually going to have a whole chapter devoted to how prices changed. Really, the GDP deflator should have been in this chapter, but it just has the same name as GDP. So I think the authors of the textbook put it in the other one, all right? So what we're doing now is we're going to be talking about prices, how price levels go up and down, OK? The, we're not going to be talking about how much goods are being made. We're just going to talk about just the general prices as they go up and down, OK? And so uh, the, the two ways that we measure prices here in America are consumer price index and the GDP deflator, OK? We'll, we'll learn about CPI and learn, uh, kind of talk a little bit about the GDP deflator, just to remind you guys how to use it. And then we'll talk about there's a ton of problems with the CPI. How is it different from the GDP deflator? Um, we're going to use the CPI to compare dollar values from different years. And then we're also going to say, what happens to interest rates when we have changes in the price level, i.e. inflation? Okay. So this word inflation just means changes in the overall price level. So all prices get a little bit more expensive. That's inflation. Okay. All right. Um, so let's, let's think about this consumer price index. So the thing that I'm trying to teach you guys today is how to measure when all the prices go up together, right? All the prices go up together. And so the question is, I mean, it should be, it should be clear to all of you. Let's say that if I say the prices are 2% more expensive this year than they were last year, that doesn't mean that all prices are exactly 2% more expensive, right? Maybe some prices are only 1% more expensive. Some prices are 10% more expensive, perhaps. And some prices, maybe on flat screen TVs, are actually maybe a couple percent lower, right? So it's, it, this is kind of like this big averaging problem. And it's a bit of an issue because at any one time, prices are not exactly all going up together, right? Some prices are going up, some prices are going down. And the question is, how on earth do I put an average on there? How do I talk about like the average level of prices in the economy when some of them are going up and some of them are going down? And so the idea is create the, the consumer price index, which is measuring the cost of living of the average person. Okay? So we're going to look at what the average person buys and then just talk about the price of all of that, whether that altogether goes up or down, even though inside what they're buying inside the bundle of stuff that they're buying. Some prices are going up, some prices are going down. We just want to measure the whole, entire, the whole entire thing, right? So what we do is we pick the average person's cost of living to measure, right? Or, or I mean, there's maybe some other ideas. We could just like pick like three items or something and, and look at how the prices go up or down. Or maybe we can just pick one item. Or maybe we could just pick, I don't know, some index, the Dow Jones stock price index, which would be a really bad approximation of the inflation rate, right? But like, we, what the, the idea here is to take this like multi-dimensional problem. There's thousands and thousands of goods, maybe hundreds of thousands, that consumers buy, and we have to reduce it to one number, you know, 5% or something like that, okay? And this is really important because um, a lot of a lot of wage contracts have these things that are called colas, cost of living adjustments. So let's say that, for example, you're, you get a job as a firefighter, and you get $60,000 a year in your wage contract this year, right? But if next year 
all the goods will get a little bit more expensive, then even though your paychecks still say $60,000, it doesn't feel like you're making $60,000, right? You feel poorer. Another way to say that is your purchasing power has decreased. So uh, most firefighting contracts have these, and many other wage contracts, have these cost of living adjustments, which say that if the inflation rate goes up 3%, your $60,000 paycheck automatically goes up 3% just to match it. So you actually have the exact same level, okay? So that's what a COLA is meaning. It means is a cost of living adjustment. Many wage contracts have COLAs. And as well as Social Security, right? How much to pay out in Social Security depends on what the overall price level is, right? If we want to keep um, an elderly person at the same standard of living for the rest of their life, we're going to have to slowly start pay the, paying them more and more as the goods get more and more expensive, OK? So this, this um, consumer price index is incredibly important in helping um, kind of like those long-term wage or income contracts stay level, OK? Um, so how is it calculated? So first, remember, what we're doing is we're imagining the thing that we're picking to check the price of it. We're going to think of this imaginary shopping cart. Imaginary shopping basket, all right? So here's what you need to do. You need to imagine that you're the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is the arm of the government that, uh, that captures this. And the first thing they do is they survey a whole bunch of people and say, what is it that you buy, right? Because basically what we're trying to do in the CPI was we're trying to figure out how the price level increases, right? So we're trying to figure out how the overall price of some shopping cart of goods goes up. Because inside that shopping cart, some goods are getting more expensive, some goods are, goods are getting cheaper. We're going to look at the price of the whole shopping cart as a whole. But first, we've got to figure out what to put in that shopping cart, right? So the first thing they need to do is they ask everybody what they buy. The Bureau of Labor Statistics does that by the Bureau of Labor Statistics does that by um, interviewing people and surveying them and figuring out what they buy. Okay? And then what do you think the next part is? After you figure out what's in the shopping cart, what's the next piece? Collect the data. Collect the data on how much the stuff costs, right? And so that's the next thing, finding the prices. So the BLS actually sends agents out to JCPenney, I don't know, to Albertsons, to all these different stores, and finds out what the prices of these items are, right? Maybe on the survey, people said, well, we buy, you know, a, a, a television. Well, now we got to figure out, you know, the television's in that shopping cart. So now we got to figure out how much that television costs. So you can see already <laughs> there's some big problems because, I don't know, does a raincoat, maybe a raincoat's in the shopping cart too. Does a raincoat cost the same amount of money in California as in Michigan as in Florida? Probably not, right? There's probably different prices all over the place, right? So already, there's another layer of averaging going on. Okay? The first layer of averaging is the price of the whole shopping cart. right? The individual prices are going up and down inside the shopping cart, but then we average it out and just talk about how the prices of the whole shopping cart increases. First level of averaging. Second level of averaging is that this shopping cart probably costs a different amount of money if I buy it in California, if I buy it in New York, if I buy it in the Midwest somewhere, right? So we have to find out the average price of the shopping cart. In order to do that, we have to go all over the nation and figure out the prices all over the nation. Yes? Just the year. Right, right. So if they average it the same way every year, it won't affect it. True. However, it might be true that the prices in California are ra rising faster than the prices in the Midwest. But the CPI will just take the average of all of that. Okay? So it does mask some, we would call those idiosyncratic changes or small individual changes. Okay? Um, all right, so, so it's, it's, it was really a kind of a good idea. They're like, we got to figure out how prices change. Well, what prices are we interested in? We just ask people what they make, we throw it into a shopping cart, what they buy, throw it into a shopping cart. Find the prices of the things in the shopping cart. Okay? And then we add them all up to see how much the shopping cart would cost if I were to go buy it at a store. Okay? And uh, so, so that's not too hard because, you know, the cost is just whatever the prices are times whatever the quantities are. Okay? That's a pretty easy step. Right? So we use the prices to compute the cost of the basket. And then we go ahead and compare 
the cost of the basket this year to the cost of the basket in some base year. And it doesn't matter what base year you choose. You can choose any one. You just have to use the same base year in your whole problem. Okay? So whatever the cost of the basket this year is, divided by the cost of the basket in the base year was. Okay? And then, uh, so this, let's say that the prices are more expensive now than they were. This will be a number greater than 1. We multiply it by 100 to get the CPI, so this will be a number greater than 100 if the prices are greater, right? If the prices have fallen since the base year, this number will be a number less than 100, OK? And in the base year, the CPI will be 100 because the cost of the basket in the current year and the cost of the basket in the base year is the same. So this is 1 times 100, OK? So, and then finally, once I have the CPI, I have the CPI for each year. Remember, I just pick one base year. Then every year I compute the CPI. Then I go ahead and just calculate the inflation rate using, uh, using this formula. It's the CPI of this year minus the CPI, CPI of last year over the CPI of last year times 100 to get an inflation rate. Remember, uh, I think I should, told you guys this in chapter 10, but rate of change, you guys have to know this for this class. Anytime you do a rate of change, like an inflation rate, right? It's always the new value minus the old value divided by the old value. And then to put it in, a, if you want it in a percentage, you have to multiply it times 100. Okay? So this is always all rates of change. If you're talking about inflation rate of change, if you're talking about interest rate of change, if you're talking about GDP rate of change, any rate of change of a, of a, of a variable that you can report as the level, but you want it as the rate of change, you need to use this formula. OK? All right. So this is how basically we do it. This is the math, basically. Now let's do a simple problem. Go ahead and come on in. OK. So here's the, here's the example. Um, I'm going to have a very simple model, obviously, in this class. All my models in this class hopefully are as simple as possible. If I have to have one good, if I can only have one good, I'll get away with it. But if I have to have more than one good, I will just have two goods. Remember, I always normally use lattes um, when we were talking about one good. When we have two goods, I don't know, pizza and lattes, right? Let's say that um, the government went ahead and surveyed all the people, and all they buy in a year <laughs> is four pizzas and 10 lattes. Clearly, this is oversimplified, but we're just going to show you how this whole CPI thing works, OK? So the first thing to do, find out what the basket is, right? The next thing to do, find out the prices, OK? So they sent out people all over the country, and they found out that in 2010, the average price of a pizza was $10, OK? And that the average price of a latte was $2, OK? Um, and then they did the same thing in 2011, they did the same thing in 2012, and they do it for every year, OK? Now, let's just figure out the cost of the basket. How much does the basket cost? This is pretty easy. Four pizzas at $10 a piece. 60. Right? Exactly. $10 at 10 lattes at $2 a piece is 60. All right? So the cost of the shopping cart is just 60. All right? In 2011, they do it again. Notice the basket doesn't change from year to year. The basket stays the same from year to year. The only thing that changes here is the price. Right? So this is kind of like the opposite of what we were measuring in GDP. Remember in GDP, we didn't care about price changes for the real GDP. Really all we care about is how much the products change. Right? So here we're measuring the exact opposite. We're not caring about how the products are changing. What we really care about is how the price changes okay? for, the, for the consumer price index. And then finally in 2012, it rose up to $78. All right. So that was step one, or and step two, figure out the cost of the basket. Now we're going to have to figure out the CPI in each year. We can't go right to the inflation rate yet. We have to calculate the CPI first and then the inflation rate. So there's the CPI in each year. Hey, uh, if 2010 is the base year, what's the CPI going to be in 2010? 100. 100. Very good. You're right that it's going to be a, a, a something interesting. It will be 100 because. It's the cost of the basket in this year divided by the cost of the basket in the base year. So that's 1, and then times 100 is, is 100. So the cost of the basket is always, I mean the CPI, excuse me, is always 100 in the base year. 
So if you're ever looking at a problem and you're trying to like, I'm trying to figure out what is the base here. Sometimes they might not even report it, although it's, it's helpful when they do. Sometimes they might not even report it because it's self-explanatory, right? 100, is, 100 is, the, uh, is the base year. Whatever year has a CPI of 100 is the base year. And then 2011, OK, so it rose to $69. And so we just look at the ratio. 69 divided by 60 times 100 is 115. Okay. And then we do it again in 2012. It rose to 78. So 78 over 60, right there, 78 over 60, divided by 100 is 130. And so the common sense interpretation of the inflation rate when you look at the CPI is actually pretty simple. Prices were at 100% or whatever you can think of them as 100% in 2010. In 2011, they went up to 115%. So what's the inflation rate between these two years? Just 15%. Exactly. OK? It's just 15%. And don't forget, when you're going to calculate inflation rates, you need to use the, the uh, rate of change formula, new minus old over old. right? So we have new minus old over old. This was easy, though, because it started at 100. 100 to 115%, you know, is just 15%, right? Um, and then if, you, if I look at this year, 130, this means that compared to 2010, the prices rose 30%, right? But maybe I want to know, compared to 2011, how much the price has changed in between this year. So I use that same formula, right? 130 minus 115 over 115, and I'll get that the prices rose 13%. OK? So finally, we've arrived at the inflation rate. So the idea is fix the basket, find the prices, find the cost of the basket, Compare that cost of the basket to some base year, which gives you the CPI, and then compare the CPIs to each other, and then uh, you can get the inflation rate, right? Yes? When the CPI is reported monthly, do they give it at an annual rate? When the CPI is. Uh, the CPI is generally reported, I think, quarterly. And remember, so the CPI is not the inflation rate. You can give. Let's say I were to report the, the CPI quarterly in between here. I might report it at 104, 108, 115, something like that. Because that's just telling you the ratio of the, how much the basket currently costs to how much it did when we started. Okay? So the CPI itself doesn't actually give you an inflation rate. It basically just is like a, a normalized version of the cost of the basket. Right? Instead of reporting the basket cost $27,000 and it went to $27,400, I just call the original cost of the basket 100, and then whatever the change in that is is just you know 101, 102% of the cost of the original basket. OK? And so that's the way we take care of this very complex problem, <laughs> which asks, how much do the price did the prices change in the last year? Because prices, some prices are going up, some prices are going down. All right. So let's have you guys go ahead and calculate. The CPI. Um, let's say that we surveyed the people and they buy 10 pounds of beef and 20 pounds of chicken every year. Uh, I have my prices here. OK. Go ahead and calculate the CPI in 2011. I've actually already done the math for you in 2010 and this year. It's 120. OK, 120. Now do the same thing for 2011. And then once you have the CPI for 2011, go ahead and do the inflation rate from 2011 to 2012, which means you'll also have to compute the CPI for 2012 here. OK? So go ahead and talk to your neighbors and take a couple minutes and, uh, and do that. All right. What did you guys get for uh, the CPI in 2011? 135. 125? 150. 150? OK, let's look at it. So remember, what we want to do is we, uh, we know the basket used to cost 120. So now we have to figure out how much the basket costs in 2011. And the cost of the basket is $150. OK? So you're 100% right that it is, uh, the cost is 150 But is that what the CPI is? No. Remember, well, all we're trying to measure here is prices. We're not trying to measure products. So we don't really care about how much the basket actually costs the actual dollar value. 
All we care about is how much it costs when I compare this number to this number, right? Because I'm not actually measuring products here, right? And, and here is the opposite of GDP. I'm measuring just the price. So 150 is not the CPI because that is the number of products or the value of the products in the basket. All I'm caring about is how the price has changed. So I compare it, right? 150 out of 120. And so I get 125 is my CPI for um, 2011, OK? And so I'll let you guys uh, go ahead and redo your math to do problem B, which the pro problem B was asking the inflation rate from 2011 to 2012. You'll also have to calculate the CPI from 2012. OK, so let's, uh, let's look at this one. What did we get for the CPI for 2012? Oh, 175. OK, very good. I think that's right. So first, we have to figure out how much the basket costs in 2012. Now it's 210. It's a lot of money. But we don't actually care about the cost of the basket, because that would feel like a GDP measure, right? Really, all we care about is the change in the prices. So I compare the cost of the basket in this year to the cost of the basket in this year. And then that's 210 over 120 times 100, 175. OK, so now that I, I have the CPI for each of these years, it was uh, 100, 125, 175. Now I just look at the change in the CPI from 2011 to 2012 to finish this question, right? Because we're not done yet. I asked what was the inflation rate from 2011 to 2012. That means I have to compare the CPI here to the CPI there. So we've only done the first step. We, compared, we figured out the CPI here. We already did this one last, last problem, right? So let's go ahead and compare that. It went from 125 to 175. So I use this formula here, right? 175, 125 over 125 is 40%, OK? So the, the average price level rose by 40% over this time, right? If you look. Right? The, uh, the price of beef actually rose much more than 40%, right? It actually rose over 100%. It rose 125% from 4 to $9. It's a 125% increase, right? Here, we only rose from 4 to 6%, right? So it's a 50% change, something like that. OK. So we have a 40% overall, overall change. Um, so in real life, the, the CPI is much bigger than pizza and lattes obviously, because it's the listing of everything in the shopping cart of the average individual. So kind of give you an idea of the percentages, right? 40% of the average individual's, quote, shopping cart contains housing, right? So that on average, people are spending 41%. 41 out of every $100 is being spent on housing, right? And if we think about you know, what you and I spend, that's probably pretty close, actually. Housing is a tremendous part of our budget. OK. Um, there is about 15% in food and beverages. There is 17% in transportation. OK, a couple of these, like recreation. Um, what is that green? That's medicine right here. Um, so to kind of give you an idea, 7% uh, education and communication, and then other 3%. So this is what's really in the CPI shopping basket, right? There's many, many goods. And we don't actually know the actual price uh, well, the Bureau of Labor Serv Statistics knows the actual price of the actual shopping cart that they're measuring. But like you and I never actually have to know the actual price, because all we're going to do is compare the CPI, meaning the price of the, of the shopping cart in this year to the price of the shopping cart in the next year. And we'll just call that the CPI. And that's what we're going to look at. Can you guys do factoring from stock to the other stock cart? No. So the CPI is just the goods. That people, that people buy. So stocks and bonds and stuff like that are not in the CPI, actually, because the only thing that's in here are goods that people buy. So there are some things that are left out of the CPI, if you can think about it. Like um, if companies buy, uh, firms buy new tractors, which are investment equipment, and the price of those tractors goes up, the average household does not buy tractors in their, <laughs> in their uh, shopping cart. So we would miss that price change, right? So there's some issues, 
with the CPI. But obviously, it's a way. There's always going to be issues, just like when we, there, we measured the GUP, there were some issues. Because we're trying to take this really complex, multi-dimensional question, how are the prices changing? And there's you know, thousands, hundreds, of thousands of different prices. And we're trying to measure them down to one single, simple number, right? Some people might even be like, that's ridiculous. You're even trying. <laughs> but um, the idea is here, it's we needed some number to try to help those people out who are on those wage contracts or getting Social Security to kind of know on average how, how we need to adjust their wage. Okay. All right, so here's another problem that uh, I want you guys to investigate. Imagine this happens. Uh, so in 2010, remember, just like the problem we just did, they buy 10 pounds beef, 20 pounds chicken, right? And, they, and it costs $120. Um, but then, oh, and they, and they bought this basket, right? 10 pounds of beef and 20 pounds of chicken in 2010 and 2011. So the CPI is going to work, right? But in 2012, let's imagine that the households actually changed. Look, because beef got really expensive. So we know what are people naturally going to do. They're going to buy less beef, and they're going to substitute it with chicken. They're going to eat more chicken, right? Um, so in, in real life, the, the, uh, the people only bought 5 pounds beef and 25 pounds chicken. Okay? So the shopping cart changed, actually, for these people. right? The shopping cart actually changed. So what I want you to do is compute the cost of the 2012 household basket, okay, and then, uh, which is this basket right here, right? Compute the cost of the 2012 household basket, and then uh, uh, compare the, per the inflation rates we get if we use the CPI basket each year or if we use the real baskets, shopping baskets every year, right? Um, so let's go ahead and do this one, and then I'll help you guys with B. All right, let me ask you guys, what did you get for the cost of the actual household basket in 2012? 195. Should be 195. OK, very good. So I'll, I'll try to write it right here, 195. The, the CPI thinks that people spent $210 on their shopping basket in 2012. But in reality, people were smart. They bought less beef. They substituted toward the chicken. And they only paid 195 actual dollars, right? So now what I want you to do is compare two different inflation rates. Um, by the way, in macroeconomics, the, Gre the lowercase Greek letter pi is, stands for inflation. I is already used for a bunch of different things. Uppercase I for investment, lowercase I for interest rate. <laughs> so we had nothing for inflation. So people do pi. Um, the reason why is because P is the prices. The Greek letter for P is pi. And so when the P changes, we just use pi. In case you're interested in why, but at any rate. So I want you to calculate the inflation rate from 2011 to 2012 um, for the CPI basket. And then I want you to do the exact same thing for the real household basket. So real household basket. OK, so remember, in this one, they actually bought the CPI basket in, in 2010 and 11, but in 2012, they bought this different basket. OK, so I want you to figure out the inflation rate in both of these situations. OK. By the way, that this one you already have done from last last problem. Okay, it was the last thing you calculated in the last problem. All right, uh, you guys ready? Need a couple more seconds. Yes, we're ready. Okay, let's do this. Um, what's the cost of? Uh, sorry, what's the cost of the? Excuse me, what's the? CPI or the inflation rate, you know, this is unclear. This should be CPI basket. OK. What's the inflation rate from 2011 to 2012 using the CPI basket? 40%. Right, uh, exactly. 40%. And then what's the one that you got? 30%. Here, 30%. OK, very good. So if I look at, um, 
195 over 150. It's a, it's a 30 percent increase. But the CPI inflation rate is 40%. So let's keep that in our minds. This is 40%. The inflation rate for the real household basket is 30%. Why the difference? Because in real life, it's in 2012, they buy less chicken than the Japanese. Right. So in real life, in 2012, they buy less beef and more chicken, right? Because the beef, remember, went up a lot. A lot, a lot. It went up um, a huge percentage change. And so if I stick to my CPI basket, that doesn't change. It's going to make the price of that basket go up a lot because I have a lot of beef in it. But in real life, the household switched out. They bought less beef, bought more chicken. So their, their um, rate of inflation, the, the real rate of inflation, the actual rate of inflation for the households is lower. Okay. Now, this is a problem, right? Because the CPI has to compare the same basket from, from year to year in general. And so the problem here, we call this substitution bias. Okay, It's called substitution bias, right? The CPI is forgetting that people are substituting to the cheaper goods. This is something we know that people do. right? People are rational um, agents that are tr always trying to optimize their happiness given their budget constraints. So when, when the some good gets too expensive, they're going to eat less of it or consume less of it. Okay, substitution bias. So the idea here is just is this right here. Some prices rise faster than others over time. Consumers substitute towards goods that become relatively cheaper. So they bought more chicken and not and less beef. Uh, and so it seems like it's so the real price increase that consumers are encountering is is less than the one. So the CPI misses this. And the CPI is therefore always too high in this case, right? When I have a substitution bias, the CPI, inflation rate calculated from the CPI, is too high. This is the real one. This is the CPI one, right? This is a problem, but it's really quite hard to overcome it because um, we're trying to keep the same basket of goods and compare it year, year after year. That was our trick, our, our way of simplifying this very complex problem, but it adds this additional issue. Okay? So if, if we have prices that are raise, rising at, at very different rates from each other, and then, and then people are um, substituting towards those cheaper goods, well, we're always going to have the substitution bias. Okay? It'll, and, and, the, and the inflation rate will be too high. So the question is, does it increase? Is it too high? Is the error in the measuring of the price level, or is the error in the measuring of living standards? And so the answer is both, because when we say an increase in the price level, like that's a pretty abstract concept. Just what the heck is the price level? What prices are we even measuring, right? The only way we know what goods, the prices of which goods to measure, are the goods that people buy. Right? And so that's, if that's our definition of what goods matter, the goods people buy, then yes, the CPI is incorrect. Because what we're trying to measure is how much the average household is, how much, here's kind of the way of thinking of it. You have an average household in this year. The average household goes to the next year. How much increase in their income would you have to pay them so they have the exact same level of, of richness? Another way to say it is the exact same level of purchasing power. Right? So they didn't get poorer as the year goes on. Right? So that's what we're trying to measure. That's the purpose of the CPI. Right? How, much do I, how much extra money do I need to give to the household for the next year to keep it at the exact same level of purchasing power? Okay? So we really do care about what they're buying. Okay, So that's one problem, substitution bias. Here's another problem, introduction of new goods. Right? What happens if you know, they, they define a shopping basket, and then in the next year, the, the, shop, the CPI shopping basket's not going to have the new goods in it, but the households really actually buy the new goods, right? Or something like that. So um, the introduction of new goods increases variety. It allows consumers to find products that more closely meet their needs, right? So it kind of makes the dollar of the value go farther. If you, can, if you have a choice now over like seven different types of iPhones, you can get the exact iPhone that you want. It makes 
your dollar feel like it's worth more because you're not forced to buy an iPhone that you didn't really want. So dollars become more valuable. And the CPI misses this effect because it uses a fixed basket of goods. Okay. Um, yeah, it's uh, the it, this one's kind of like a, an abstract theoretical issue, right? Um, I like my new goods more than my old goods, so I want to keep this. Remember the household that goes from old, uh, last year to this year? I want to keep them at the exact same level of purchasing power or at happiness or something like that. Well, with the introduction of this new good, this new household is happier even though it didn't actually need the extra money just because they have this new good. right? So if I'm trying to keep the level of purchasing power, the level of happiness of the household equal between the two years, um, I really actually don't need as much extra money because this household is actually just going to buy this other good that it really actually wants. Okay. So that's the idea of, of the CPI. Again, if a lot of goods are introduced, the CPI will overstate um, the increases in the cost of living. Right. So the CPI is going to be too high if there's a lot of new goods. Okay. And finally, there's one other big issue is um, unmeasured quality change. So these are not new goods, but these are current goods in the basket that are getting better. right? So it increases the value of each dollar. Um, here's the idea. If the, the basket in 2005, which is maybe your base year, has an iPhone 1 in it, right? and your basket in 2014 has an iPhone 6 Plus, right? <laughs> That's clearly a very different product, right? And it actually, the iPhone 6 Plus might actually cost way more than the original iPhone, but it should because it's way better, right? So even though it's filling the BLS's like telephone slot or something like that in the, um, in the new basket, and it feels like the new basket's getting more expensive just because the iPhone 6 Plus is way better than the original iPhone, right? That's okay because. The, the, the quality of this new basket is actually much higher, right? So it's going it, to, if you forget about the fact that this new phone is better than the old phone, it just looks like it's a plain old price increase. If you think that they're just both iPhone 1s, or whatever they used to call it, I think just plain old iPhone, it just looks like it got way more expensive, right? But really what happened is you're getting a way better phone. So if you're not measuring quality change, then the prices are just going to go up. And that's not actually true because you, you're getting a new, better product. Okay? Or if, for example, you have a, Honda, a 2005 Honda Accord and you have a 2015 Honda Accord, well, the 2015 Honda Accord might cost more, but it's a way better car than the 2005 Honda Accord. Right? So if you're just comparing Honda Accord, it's going to look like the car just got more expensive. But it didn't maybe really. Maybe it's the, the same price except for the quality improvements on the 2015 Honda Accord is what are making the price go up. Right? So that's actually a change in the products. Right? We don't want to measure a change in products. We just want to measure a change in the price level. Okay? So the BLS tries hard to, to account for quality changes. But as you can imagine, this is a really hard, uh, a really hard thing to measure. Right? How do you measure which is better, the 2005 Honda Accord or 2015 Honda Accord? I don't, I don't really know. Um, really hard to measure. But overall, uh, the CPI, anytime you have this problem, is going to overstate the increase, right? Because some of the increase is actually due to quality change or quality increase, but the CPI just thinks it's all due to increase in, in the price level. Okay? Overall, um, all of these problems cause the CPI to overstate the inflation rate. Does that make sense? So sometimes colas don't always say exactly whatever the CPI inflation rate is. Right. Sometimes colas are like, we'll, we will increase your wage by, your, your cola will be the CPI inflation rate plus 2%, or the CPI inflation rate minus 0.5%. Right? So the cola just uses the CPI plus whatever they want to do, in the CPI inflation rate. Okay? It doesn't, a cola is not always exactly the, the CPI inflation rate, but that's how it's determined. Okay. 
All right, so here's basically the summary of all the problems. Each of the problems causes the CPI to be too high, right? To in overstate the inflation. So the BLS does a really good job, actually. You can imagine how hard this job is. <laughs> Very hard. There are actually BLS agents who go out and they go to JCPenney's and they pull off the raincoats and they're like, well, is this London Fog raincoat the same as this raincoat uh, be that we had last year in the, in the bucket, but it's not available anymore? So sure, we're going to go ahead and make this substitution. right? It's really interesting. You guys can read up a little more on how they do this, but it's quite a technical uh, process. Um, but most people, I mean, economists think that maybe a half a percent per year the CPI is over and over inflates the actual inflation rate um, that is experienced by households. So it's pretty darn close, though, basically is what that's saying. With all these technical adjustments, it's pretty darn close. And it's better now than it was, much better now than it used to be, because they've paid a lot of attention to these problems. Um, and yeah, just like we were actually just talking about. Social Security, cost of living adjustments, COLAs, they depend on this, uh, in this knowledge of the inflation rate. So the CPI inflation rate has to be pretty accurate, or else we're going to be overpaying or underpaying these people. And that's not actually good for the welfare of our society. We want to be uh, paying them exactly what, uh, what they're worth. All right, so uh, now let's go ahead and reach back to chapter 10 and grab that other measure of inflation, GDP deflator, right? We're going to kind of compare those and think about those. Because if you've been thinking about it, it's, it's two totally different ways of measuring the exact same thing. How does the overall level of prices go up, right? For that reason, I was saying the GDP deflator really should have been in this chapter, but we taught, talked about it last chapter so you guys would understand how it went together with GDP. But if you look, they're pretty darn close, right? The, uh, here it is. The blue is CPI, the red is GDP deflator. So they're almost the exact same. There's a little time when it's a little bit different. But in general, when there's spikes, um, they're caught in both of them. Right? In this place, the spike went up higher for the CPI than the GDP deflator. Um, so maybe the idea here is whatever it is that the prices that CPI is measuring, versus the prices that GDP deflator is measuring, these prices went up more <laughs> right, than whatever. And, and, and that's exactly what happened. And we'll talk a little bit about what's, when it's in each of them. So uh, first, as a, as a, to recall, what is the GDP deflator? How does that work? Remember. Nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100. Basically, it is what you're looking at the difference between nominal and real GDP. So let's do a real quick review on these words. Nominal GDP means just whatever the prices are that year, right? Nominal comes from Latin name, nominus. So it's just whatever the named prices are that year. So when nominal GDP changes, two things are changing, actually. The actual quantity of production, which is what we want to measure, and then also, unfortunately, prices are changing when nominal GDP changes. right? So what I do is we correct that by making what's called the real GDP. We just take the prices from one base here. And then when the real GDP changes, the only thing that's changing is the production or the products, the output, right? So if I look at the difference between the nominal and the real GDP, this has both quantity and price changes. This has just quantity changes. So I will look at, when I look at the difference between the two, that is going to give me price changes, right? And it's going to give me the price changes of everything that's measured in GDP, OK? So this is kind of maybe a different way to think about it. This would be the overall price level for the whole country as a whole, not for individual households, because this GDP includes a lot of things that households don't buy, right? Commercial office buildings, right? Households don't buy those, but they're in the GDP, okay? Uh, giant, uh, I don't know, giant 
presses that automobile manufacturers use to press aluminum for their auto automobile bodies, right? That's in GDP because those are purchased under investment. But households don't buy those, so they're not in the, in the CPI, right? So this gives us kind of the same idea, the same flavor. It's how does the prices change from one year to the next? Um, but the, the products that we're measuring are just different. And so that's really the key between the differences, the GDP deflator and the CPI. The CPI is this shopping cart from this hypothetical family for a year. And the GDP is how does the prices change on just everything that's produced inside the country in a given period of time. Does that make sense, the difference between the two? Yeah. So let's do a little compare and contrast. What about imports? Imports. Are those made inside America? No. But the household might buy them, right? So imported stuff, I don't know, a bottle of wine from Argentina might be in the shopping cart of the original household. So it'll show up in CPI, right? But will it show up in the GDP deflator? No, because it doesn't, um, it's not produced inside America. And therefore, the GDP, neither the nominal nor the real GDP, will change because it's an import. OK? Here's another one. Capital goods or investment goods. Who? Do households buy investment goods? No. So it's going to be left out of the shopping cart, but that will be in the GDP deflator. Okay. So, well, if it's produced domestically, that's important, of course. Um, it will be in the GDP deflator. So when, uh, when prices of these goods change, it will be picked up in the GDP deflator, but not the CPI. Okay. And uh, here's the idea. The CPI uses this fisk ba fixed basket of the hypothetical family. The GDP uses whatever the basket for the GDP is whatever's being produced in the country in that year. Okay? And so uh, if all of the prices are kind of changing around the same amount, they'll be almost the same exact number. But there are some times when the goods change differently and they're a little bit different, like I showed you on that last graph. Okay? So you can kind of imagine, what would happen if the price of imported goods went up a lot? The price of imported goods went up a lot? Well, imports are in the CPI. So the CPI would go up a lot, but the GDP deflator would not go up that much. Well, it would not go up at all, actually, for imported goods, Okay, if that was the only price thing that changed. Or if uh, tractors went up a bunch, the price of tractors went up a bunch, the CPI is not going to change at all, but the GDP deflator will go up. All right? So these are the reasons behind the differences in that graph that I, that I just showed you. So the, the, the question is, um, if tractors went up, then whatever the goods that the tractors produce might go up too, and then it would be captured in the CPI. Yes, that's 100% that's true. So it might have um, like spillover effects that would increase the CPI. But the direct increase in the price of the tractor would, not, would, would only make the GDP deflator go up, not the CPI. OK, let's have you guys think about this. So in each scenario, determine the effects of the CPI deflator and the GDP deflator, and what is changing and in which direction is changing, or if it's not changing at all. Okay. So if Starbucks raises the price of its Frappuccinos, Caterpillar raises the price of the tractors. We just kind of talked about that a little bit. And then Armani raises the price of the Italian jeans that it sells in the United States. Whoops. Um, figure out which changes, CPI, GDP, both, in which direction? All right, let's, let's look at it. So Starbucks raises the price of Frappuccinos. Which of these measures of inflation change? Both of them. Both of them, right. Because the average person buys Starbucks, right? So it's going to be in that cart. Also, it's produced domestically, so it, the, pr the value of the production of Starbucks does go into um, the GDP, so the GDP deflator will also rise. Very good. Okay, uh, Caterpillar tractor 
raises the price of these tractors that it manufactures in Illinois, so in America. Um, GDP deflator does what? It goes up, right, because tractors is included in the GDP, so it will be in the GDP deflator. Very good. Uh, what about CPI? Do uh, households buy tractors in their shopping carts? No. So it won't be in the CPI, right? The CPI just stays the same level as before. The GDP deflator, though, does go up, OK? Because the average household doesn't buy tractors. Although it'd be cool, but we don't. <laughs> All right. What, uh, what about this Armani? OK, this is an Italian company. Uh, the price of a jeans made in Italy, um, that they, but are sold in the United States. The CPI is going up. The CPI is going to go up because the average person in their shopping cart might have Armani jeans, right? But will the GDPs change? No, neither nominal nor GDP will change. I mean, excuse me, neither nominal GDP nor real GDP will change because these things are imports, right? They're made outside. And so here you have it. The CPI rises, the GDP deflator does not. OK? All right, so now we get to a really beneficial part about the CPI. What I can do is I, compare, I can compare some amount of dollars in this year to some amount of dollars in this year and compare and see if they're equal in in purchasing power, right? I can say, oh, a house that made $10,000 a year in 1930, is it the same as a house that makes $100,000 a year in 2015, 2014, right? Because what I'm asking is, can they buy the same amount of goods? Or is their household equally as happy or something like that, right? Um, and so here's how we're, how we're going to do that. With inflation, it's a problem because $10,000 in 1930 is not the same as $10,000 in 2015 at all, right? $10,000 in 1930 would, would buy you a lot, but it won't buy you quite as much. It'll still buy you a lot today, but it won't buy you nearly as much because the prices of everything are so much more expensive. So we have to do some sort of correction for the change in prices over that time period, okay? And so let's say we want to compare the minimum wage over two time periods and say, are the workers better off, equal, or, or, or worse off under the minimum wage now? So in December 1963, the minimum wage was 125. We're like, oh, dang, that sounds really low, right? <laughs> it does. Man, can you imagine only making 125 an hour? But the question is, I mean, we, since we know everybody uh, paid way less for their goods, the prices were way lower. What did 125 back then feel like in today's dollars or something like that, right? So the question is, um, uh, we'll compare it to 725 in December 2013. That was the federal minimum wage. It'd be like, OK, nominally, right? Nominally, it looks like these people are getting more money, right? Just because the number's bigger. That's what nominally means, right? Nominally, it looks like it's getting bigger. But what is the real wage, right? Remember, whenever I use real, the word real in front of something, Versus nominal, I'm talking about the actual amount of stuff that you can buy or that you can purchase, right? That's what real means. Really what I, really, actually what I care about is real wage, right? All the time. I care about the, re, whatever the variable is, I care about the real version of it, not the nominal version of it. Because the nominal version of it, I'm not sure what's happening with the prices. Okay, so I want to know what the real wage difference is. And uh, so the way I can phrase the question is, did the minimum wage have more purchasing power Back here or in 2013? Where did the guy who was working minimum wage feel richer? That's what purchasing power means, right? Because it always comes down. We don't care about money, the dollar value. We care about how much stuff that the person could buy. Because that's how much their welfare or how, how um, their standard of living was, right? We care about the stuff that they can buy. OK, so did minimum wage have more purchasing power in 1963 or December 2013? So let's go ahead and just use the CPI from those two years to compare it, OK? So let's do that. Um, we'll use this formula. Now, so if I, if I know an amount in year T dollars, I multiply it by the ratio of the CPIs, and that'll give me an amount in today's dollars. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to change $1.25 in December 1963 and tell you what it feels like in 2013. 
and then we can compare. Okay. I mean, on the other hand, I could have changed 725 in 2013 and moved it back and told you what it would feel like back in 1963, but uh, you could do either way. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take everything and talk about it in today's dollars or in 2013 dollars. Right. So year T is December 1963. Today is December 2013. So I got to go find CPIs for that. Um, so here's the CPI. 30.9 in December 1963. I can get that from the BLS website. right? And it was 234.6 today. All right? So basically, what these num remember what these numbers are telling us is that whatever the base year was, maybe it was probably around maybe the year 2000 or something like that, right? Prices are 234.6% of what they were in, uh, in the base year. And then prices here are only 30% of what they were in the base year. That's what the CPI is telling, telling me. All right, and so let's just go ahead and plug it into this formula here. And so I got 125 times the price level today, 234.6. Divided by the price level in year T, 30.9, equals 949. So this guy who was making $1.25 in 1963, it, he, he felt like if you were to make, bring him into 2013, you'd have to pay him $9.49 to feel the same, to have the same purchasing power. Okay. Um, now, of course, right? we're totally neglecting the fact that you know, maybe you wouldn't actually have to pay them quite this much because of, you know, quality of life changes. Like, now we have cell phones, and maybe our life is more fun. Even though I get paid less, maybe my life is more fun because I can play Flappy Bird on my phone, all right, or something like that. This guy in 1963 couldn't do that, right? So we're forgetting about that, okay? But there's no real way to pick up that difference, right? So we're just going to realize that we're missing it, but it's, uh, it is um, a good guess, right? So the guy who's being paid $1.25 uh, in 1963, it, it felt to him like as if he was getting paid $9.49 when I look at it in 2013. So in essence, even though the nominal minimum wage has increased, right? It went from $1.25 to $7.25. The nominal minimum wage did. We don't care about nominal variables. We care about real variables. So what did the real minimum wage do? The real minimum wage has actually gone down, right? Because the real minimum wage felt like 9.49 an hour in 1963, and it's gone down to, uh, you know, 7.25. And they're going to raise. They've been talking about raising their federal minimum wage again, actually. So it's a really interesting um, idea. Or uh, it's it's very pertinent to our time right now. Okay. So. Often, we care about comparing some value or some, some dollar value or some variable over time. But I don't care about the nominal values of the variable. I care about the real values of the variable. So um, you just have to go through and convert each of those nominal ones into the real uh, versions of the variable using the CPI, and then you can compare them. Okay, and so. After you can correct it for inflation, then you can actually see how much the real value of the variable has changed. Okay, so let's plot the minimum wage, both the nominal and the real minimum wage, on a graph. Okay, so first, nominal minimum wage. Clearly, it's been going up. 1963 is $1.25, right? And it's all the way up to seven something, and they're trying to raise it to like I don't know, like ten or twelve or something dollars an hour, fifteen dollars an hour. Some people are are clamoring for. I've heard that. Nominal minimum wage has surely gone up, right? But if I were to convert each of these, each of these dollars into 2013 dollars, and then just graph it in just and what it would feel like in 2013, it looks much different. I call this the real minimum wage. Okay, so the real minimum wage has actually it peaked over over here in 1970-ish, 1965, and then it's been kind of falling, and then it kind of rose a little bit here ever since. Okay, um, there was actually a period when inflation in 2009 in America, inflation actually went down. It was negative; price level fell. So that's going to make the um, the uh, real minimum wage go back up 
during that time, right? Because if all prices fall, then I feel like I'm getting paid more, even though I the actual minimum wage stayed the same, right? Okay. So this just it tells you it's. Just kind of an idea that I want to keep germinating in your guys' brains. Nominal variables don't really matter. The only variables that actually matter are real variables. OK? I mean, you could do anything you want to money. You could put a whole bunch more money in the economy, but then all the prices would just increase to soak up that extra money in the whole economy. Everybody would get paid more to be able to buy the more expensive goods, but nobody actually changed if they're better off or not, right? So money is just kind of this like, I mean, it's not even based on a gold standard anymore. So it can be whatever you want, right? A nominal variable is just, it was really meaningless. You have to look at the real ones, OK? OK, here's a kind of a tricky problem. I want you to calculate um, the difference in prices between these schools, private, nonprofit, public, or four-year, public, two-year, in 1990 versus 2013. Right? We know that schools have been getting more expensive, but these are just nominal numbers. Right? If I go and I look at you know, college trend, collegeboard.org, they're going to um, give me nominal variables. And if I am not a smart economic student, if I'm just a naive student, I would just compare these and be like, oh, dang, it's way more expensive. Right? But clearly, I know this is not the appropriate comparison. I have to change these into $2,013 first. Right? So what I want you to do is I want you to go through and I want you to convert each of these into $2,013 using these CPIs and um, the formula that I gave you a couple slides back. Okay? And then we can actually compare. All right, again, so you'll want to have these three numbers, redo them in 2013 numbers using this one. Today's dollars equals the dollars that it was then over the CPI today, times CPI today over CPI then. All right. So um, I want to point out this because this is such a great test question. right? It tests like everything in this whole chapter that we've gone over all in one thing. right? So, so when you and look at a question like this in my class, right? which type experience the largest increase in real tuition costs, right? There's a couple things you need to look at. First, you're like, oh, real tuition costs. So if I'm talking about a real tuition costs, I'm not talking about the nominal tuition costs. These are nominal, but really what I want is the real tuition cost, means adjusted for inflation, right? So that gives you a key that I have to go ahead and convert all of these into 2013 dollars, right? So I convert all of these three. So that's the first key. And then I need to know which type experienced the largest increase. So now I have to look at some sort of percentage change, which uses the percentage change formula um, from, from earlier, right? OK, so you have to do all that stuff together. So let's go ahead and throw it up there and see what we got. So here's the new, the new uh, numbers that you calculated. And there's an error on this slide. Um, Mark that out. That's not $2,010. That's actually $2,013. OK? So uh, just so everybody knows, this it, on your guys' sheet, is it 2010 or 2013? 2010. OK. Sorry about that. Um, I go ahead and convert this using the CPI, right? Um, the CPIs were back here, 232.6 and 130.7. I use the CPIs. I got 16,662 for uh, the $2,013 of this. I just changed this into that. Well, this is already in $2,013, so when I change it to $2,013, it stays the same. So what's the percent change in price? Right? New value minus the old value divided by the old value, I get 81% increase. All right? So private four years really increased 81% in, in price. Right? When we take out the difference in changes for inflation. 81% increase in price. Everybody understand how we got this thing right here? This 16,622 is just plug in this formula. I put the 9,340 here times the CPI today, it was like 232.6. Divided by the CPI then, it was like 130.7 or something like that. And spits out 16,662. And then I go ahead and use the percent of change uh, calculation to get 81%. Same thing here. Uh, 
it, it used to cost $1,908 to go to a public four-year, and uh, that would feel like $3,396 in 2013 dollars. Well, now it's $8,893 in 2013 dollars. So that's 161% change, public four years. Wow, that's a huge percent. This is the real percent of change, not the nominal percent of change, right? The nominal percent of change is going to be even bigger, but that's not, that's not really what happened because everything got a little bit more expensive. Okay? And then, uh, look, public two years used to be $906, like some, something like Coastline Community College. Uh, $906, now it's $3,264. But I can't compare these nominal numbers. I have to convert them into real 2013 dollars. So the real increase is 102%. So the biggest increase has been seen at public four years, right? And that's true. Over at UC Irvine, for example, like the tuition rates have climbed steadily since I did, I did my undergrad. I graduated in 2007, and uh, I pay nearly, or the students now pay nearly double what I paid even in 2000 and. 2004, 2005. So the question is, have the other goods increased by almost 100% uh, in the last 23 years? Now, it's important to realize that this number, these numbers are already corrected for inflation. So this is as if all the other goods, the way to think about it, when you put everything in real dollars like that, it's as if all the other goods stayed exactly the same level of price. Does that make sense? In real life, uh, the the public four year has gone from 1908 to 8893, right? That would give you like, oh, I don't know, like almost like 300% change or something like that, 350% change just in the nominal dollars. But like a lot of the other goods have gotten more expensive too. So we have to take out that effect. We can put them both into real dollars, and this is 161% change. So the way to think of this is 161.9% is change thinking about or controlling all the other prices, keeping them flat. OK? Uh, so this is what it's called when I index a variable. It means I correct it for inflation. Um, automatically corrected in a bylaw or in a contract, it's called indexing. Right? So that's what a cost of living adjustment is. right? When I give a, a, an index, an inflation indexed wage contract, that means the wage contract automatically adjusts every year to keep up with the inflation so that the person feels like they're getting paid the same amount each time. That's called an indexed wage. wage. And for people, if you ever sign a multi year wage contract, it's good to make sure it's indexed, or else by the end of that contract, you're going to be poorer. <laughs> vis-a-vis -vis uh, you at the beginning, right? Um, so that's the idea behind indexation, right? And uh, these things are indexed, multi-year labor contracts with a COLA and then Social Security payments. And also federal income tax brackets actually are, are indexed. Remember, the, the richer people, the people with higher incomes have to pay higher levels of taxes. Well, if those income brackets stayed still, then everybody's creeping into the, into the higher bracket accidentally because though just the whole, you know, everything's getting more expensive. People are going into the higher bracket accidentally. So we want those brackets, the federal tax brackets, to keep moving with the people and so that they're, index, they're indexed to inflation. Okay? That's actually, if you guys ever heard it, is referred to as bracket creep when people are accidentally you know, getting into the higher tax brackets, not because they're actually richer compared to everybody else, but because of some technical snafu or technical difficulty with the determination of where those bracket boundaries should be. All right, and finally, I want to talk about real versus nominal interest rates. So remember, we have real versus nominal everything. Right? Any rate that I measure or any va variable that I measure has a real part and a, a real component and a, and a nominal component. Uh, let's think about interest rates, OK? So if, just a plain old nominal interest rate is the interest rate, for example, if you put your money into the savings account at the bank, they tell you, oh, we're going to give you 3% on your money or something like that. That is a nominal interest rate, right? That's just the amount of interest they're going to pay you. It's not corrected for inflation. and um, 
It's generally thought of as the rate of growth in the dollar value of a deposit or, or your debt at, for your house or something like that if you take a car loan. The real interest rate, however, is corrected for inflation. And this tells you the rate of change of the purchasing power of the amount of money, which is what we really care about. This just tells you what the rate of growth of the dollar value is. This gives you the rate of growth in the purchasing power. Okay. And so the way you calculate it is really simple. The real interest rate is just the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. The nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. So think about it this way. Let's say you take your money and you put it in a savings account and they say, we're going to pay you 5% on your money. Right? You're like, oh, that's cool. My dollar value is going to grow 5%, right? But what if during that same amount of time, inflation is going up 5%, right? When you get to the end of that time, you know, a year or two years later, and you take your money out, does it feel like it grew at 5%? No. Actually, it ends up buying the exact same amount of things as you could have at the beginning. Because even though the dollar value grew 5%, the prices of everything you were going to buy grew 5% too. So the real interest rate is actually the 5% interest rate that they gave you minus the 5% inflation rate. It's actually 0%. In other words, it didn't feel like it grew at all. And that's called the purchasing power. And that's truly what we care about. When we put money in the bank and we're looking at how much interest we're going to get on our money, we don't care about the nominal rates, right? We care about the real, the real rates. Or the same thing, when the bank loans you money for a house, right? And they say, oh, uh, you know, it's, you're going to have to pay 4% interest per year, right? The rate of growth of my debt is going up 4%. But really, what me and the bank has cared about is what's the real interest rates we're going over, right? Let's suppose that the bank's charging me 4% for the money, right? But prices are going up 4% also. That feels to me like I'm getting the money for free, actually. Because everything is going up 4% anyway, not just my loan. So my, own, my wage is probably going up 4%. Everything's going up 4%. So it feels like I'm getting it for free. Okay, So that's, that's the way to calculate it. Real interest rate, nominal interest rate, minus inflation rate. Here's a quick example. Let's suppose that you put $1,000 in the bank for a year. The nominal interest rate the bank tells you, they're not going to tell you the real interest rate because there's no way to know the real interest rate because it depends on the expected inflation rate. Right? We don't know that yet, not until after the year's over. During that year, inflation is 3.5%. At the end of the year, you're going to get 9% more dollars, right? But it doesn't feel like it's 9% more dollars. The purchasing power is not 9% more than it used to be. It's only 5.5% of what it used to be because I have to subtract off the inflation rate. OK, so this is the, uh, the summary here. The purchasing power has gone up 5.5%. So we would say the real interest rate on that deposit was 5.5%, even though the nominal one was 9%. We don't care about nominal because it's, that's not really what we're experiencing. Okay, And so here's real nominal interest rates in the United States. right? Nominal interest rates sometimes got very, very high, but the real interest rate was quite low. What does that mean was going on right here if the nominal was high but the real was low? High inflation, right? High inflation. And look at this. This is really crazy. You can actually have negative interest rates, which is a really bad thing. <laughs> negative real interest rates, right? That means that I put my money in my savings account at the bank, and then actually at the end of the, of the year, I'm getting back less than I originally had put in it. And I'm like, well, wow, that's terrible. I should have just used it and spent it all on stuff at the beginning, right? So you see that this real inflation, this negative real inflation rate problem is more common than you think. Okay? And it can happen either time. It can happen either if we have high inflation, as is the case here in the late 70s, early 80s, high inflation. The other time it can happen is here when I have normal inflation, but my nominal interest rates are almost at zero anyway. Okay? This is what's going on right now. You can't make a nominal interest rate like zero is the lower bound for the nominal interest rate. But in real life, because you're getting almost zero on your money, but there is inflation, you have negative real interest rates. And this is, this is actually still going on right now, negative real interest rates. So do banks want to lend money very often? <laughs> No, right? So this is a problem because now people are having problems getting loans because banks are like, 
heck no, I'm not going to loan out this money. I'm actually paying you to take a loan from me. How am I? This is an unsustainable business model, right? So it's a big problem, these negative interest rate traps. Okay. All right, so a quick summary. The CPI is a measure of the cost of living because we're trying to measure the price level. So what, are, what prices are we going to measure? The things that are bought in the regular cost of living. So it just tracks the consumer's basket of goods and services. It's used to make COLA uh, to, for cost of living adjustments and to correct economic variables for the effects of inflation. Um, and the real interest rate, you correct it for inflation by just sub subtracting off the interest rate or the uh, inflation rate from the nominal interest rate. OK? Any questions? All right, we are done for today.